So we should start. That way you can go to lunch earlier. Uh, thank you for coming. If you're here, it means you probably need, you care more about BetterFS than the kernel. Otherwise, you'll be talking, uh, listen to John's talk about all of the kernel. Uh, I'm not John, but I'll try to do as good as he does. <laughs> uh, feel free to interrupt me for any questions during the talk, uh, especially if it's something about the slides. Um, otherwise, we can do questions at the end, and you can grab me also uh, at the end of the talk. So, oops. So why am I here and talking to you about ButterFS since I didn't actually write a single line of code in a kernel on ButterFS? Uh, I have some user space stuff that I'm, I'll talk about uh, later. Um, been uh, using Linux for a long time, a bunch of file systems um, back when we had even ext2. Um, but interestingly enough, I worked at Network Appliance in, uh, a long time ago, in 97. And even back then, they had file system snapshots. And it's a little bit like crack once you had it. You just don't want to give it back. It's just, you have history. You know what your file was an hour ago, yesterday. You can go back and get it. It's just freaking awesome. Um, I wanted that on Linux, and Linux had LVM. So, oh, great. I'll just snapshot my blog device. Except, oh, my God, the LVM, so slow. If you do snapshots, it just multiplies right. I, I got down to about 2 megabytes per second on my RAID 5 server at home. It was unusable. I mean, I needed it, but... Ah, oh, anyway, I wanted something better, and I've been wanting something better for a long time. So, eventually, <laughs> and we had a few, you know, things that came in the middle, but nothing really worked well until ButterFS for me. Um, and we'll talk about uh, ZFS also. Um, so that was one thing. And then um, the other thing I like about LVM is having partitions without having to actually repartition a disk, which is a pain in the butt, as most people know. So LVM did a good job with that, but. Uh, again, the, the performance was an issue. So I switched to ButterFS about three years ago after going to an LCA talk, strangely enough, about ButterFS. And back then, it was still a bit rough around the... Uh, yeah, it was a bit <laughs> rough around the edges. It's, it's definitely better now, so I won't have to be lying to you as much as the uh, nice person who told me that ButterFS was great three years ago. Uh, he did it. I, I'm just joking. So ButterFS, why should you uh, consider ButterFS? I mean, really a big feature, um, which is not new, right? But it's uh, something you can have today in Linux, which wasn't really available before, is copy and write on the file system level. And I'll give you more details as to why it actually matters. Uh, snapshots, as I mentioned. Um, one thing you can do between um, sub-volumes, you, you can copy a file without actually copying the blocks. So you just say, hey, here's a new inode. There are different inodes, different owners, different permissions, but they write, they point to the same blocks until you start modifying one block, and then just that one block gets modified, which is a much better thing than just hard links. Uh, metadata is redundant and checksums, uh, which is not quite true in the ext4. Uh, they have patches for that. And um, if you think, use things like Docker, ButterFS is really um, a nice underlying file system for Docker, and, and they explain why. Um, also, uh, Susan now offers a very nice option where you do an upgrade, and it shows you, hey, and you don't upgrade just doing anything you want, right? Command line, RPM, whatever. It snapshots before and after and tells you those are the files that changed uh, without you even knowing, you know, why. And then you can go and roll back to the previous system if your system is not very happy anymore. Other things are built-in RAID. Um, I'll give you a bit more details. So to be fair, built-in RAID is not totally finished. It kind of works, but there's a few things that are not fully... Uh, um, on par with the uh, DM RAID in the kernel. But, you know, it's getting there and having it in the file system removes one layer in the middle and makes it more uh, efficient a lot faster. It has file compression, which is also, always very nice for some kinds of data. Um, as I mentioned, partitions, uh, you, I'll give you details. You create one big pool and then you can create uh, sub-volumes that actually act as partitions. <laughs> You can do online uh, background scrub, which is not a full FSCK, but it will find some issues without you having to unmount uh, your file system. <coughs> the big thing, um, which I'll give you details, and that's part of the reason why I gave the talk about file system, uh, file system pushes via diffs, is the option of doing uh, better FS uh, send and receive, which basically lets you snapshot the file system show a diff between the previous snapshot and a new one, and just send that diff to the other side, and then have the new file system on the other side be in sync with the server by just sending over the blocks, as opposed to doing a big copy like rsync would. And a little, I mean, I, I find it kind of cool, although, you know, it's better to start clean, but where I first convert can actually 
convert an ext3 file system to BatteryFS without reformatting. It's, the idea is scary, but it, it does that. So uh, before anyone asks, uh, hey, well, do we have Z ZFS? And yeah, we do, actually. Uh, ZFS is actually still more mature than BatteryFS today. Um, so if you didn't care about licensing, if you are on uh, SunOS Solaris, um, ZFS is a perfectly, I'd say, really good file system. It has a lot of uh, people and, um, who work behind it. And it still definitely has more features. It's more stable. Um, but it wasn't really designed for Linux. So they have people uh, who have put it to Linux. It's called uh, OpenZFS. They've done a good job trying to make it work as well as possible. Um, it's not really designed to work with the memory subsystem, so it does use more memory. But, you know, it's only RAM. Like some people don't care. You just pay, pay for that. The bigger problem is licensing. So I'm not an open source lawyer, thankfully for me. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, Sun obviously had that code, and Oracle bought Sun. So Oracle effectively owns the uh, patents and the uh, licensing to the original code. Um, you may have heard that uh, ZFS is not compatible with the Linux kernel, as in you can put it to get together yourself, but you cannot distribute it to anyone, which is kind of a problem. Um, now, Oracle happens to be the company that put a lot of time and effort be behind ButterFS, so I asked myself, well, why would they still be writing ButterFS when they have the ZFS code, which is perfectly good? I mean, it's not perfect, but it's much further along. Um, never really got a good answer for that. So the thing, I mean, they have a page that says, well, we would have to go talk to all the people who gave us patches and ask them if it would be okay to relicense, and that's a lot of work. I'm not quite buying that. It's been done before. Um, so I looked at, into it a bit more, and I, when I asked them, they said, well, you know, we rather focus on a new file system, but RFS, that's the future for us. So as for, they didn't tell me, you know, ZFS is dead as far as we're concerned, but I think that's what I heard. <laughs> uh, and by the way, you, you, you're welcome to, um, and all the, the quotes here, and especially all the links that you see, um, you can get the slides, and those links are clickable, so you can get the longer quotes, and um, I'll be giving scripts later, so you don't have to um, write everything down. So the other, another person working on that said it's a non optimal approach, which is not native, so as I said, it doesn't integrate as well for memory. Um, but I still think you know, it would be a lot easier to fix ZFS to be a first tier file system for Linux if it weren't a licensing issue. Then again, patents. Well, <laughs> so NetApp actually sued Sun on ZFS uh, because it infringed Waffle patents, which is their Waffle being the uh, NetApp file system. Now, it turns out actually <laughs> Sun attacked NetApp first. So effectively, it's just another patent uh, war. A um, lot of uh, good lawyer and people time wasted over this. Um, and well, they. Obviously, had lawyers, they ended up settling out of court, so we don't know exactly what happened and who said what. Um, but my take is that they, had a, they may have made an agreement that, um, you know, maybe Sun or Oracle was not going to be further working on ZFS. That's just my guess. It could be something totally different. Um, but I think, you know, Oracle's a bunch of smart people. They have that really good code base, and they're not using it, so there must be a reason. But whatever the reason is, we're here today. ZFS is not going to become GPL2 tomorrow. It will never be in the Linux kernel. You will never be able to make a product and distribute um, a better F sorry, ZFS as a product with kernel. So, you know, if you want to use it at home for your home, ser home server, by all means do so. You can to totally do that. If you're using your company for your personal servers in the company, that's fine too, until you're trying to shape a product with that. And... I've seen many places where you do something internally, and then one day someone says, hey, we should sell that. And if your product depends on ZFS only, then you're in trouble. Um, as an example, like even a Google, you know, Google search was supposed to be an internal product, and there's a Google search appliance that is being sold. So if it required a ZFS, we could not ship that without being sued. So that's for ZFS. It's not a ZFS talk, but I had to explain why, you know, why even bother with ButterFS. So the next thing is, well, okay, ButterFS, you keep hearing how it's not really stable yet or it's not really, it's still experimental. And technically it is experimental in the kernel, um, but it is pretty, pretty stable. Um, it was stable enough when I started using it three years ago and it's definitely much better now. But, you know, you have to be careful with how to use it. You definitely have to be careful with backups and so forth. So I will give you details on that. 
Um, I gave some kernel versions here. Uh, you definitely want newer kernels. You don't want to be using something very old uh, because there are many, many bugs that are being fixed all the time. So currently, I would uh, recommend anything uh, better than 3.16.2. Um, let's see. So one thing um, that could be an issue sometimes is it needs to be re uh, manually rebalanced. So you have space, but it tells you your file system is full. It's not fatal, but it means you have to do something yourself to kind of unwedge the file system, which is a little bit annoying. And it's, it's doing that better by itself now, but it's still um, not fully um, automatic. Uh, defragmentation is also, uh, auto defragmentation still has a few issues also. Um, send receive is definitely usable and perfectly good as of, as of uh, 3.14, which is now a reasonably, uh, I don't want to say ancient, but it's, you know, it's not a yesterday's kernel. Uh, RAID 5.6, uh, I'll give you more details. That's usable, but I wouldn't put anything production on that. So what's missing? Um, everyone says, oh, but if there's no FSCK, you can't use that. Well, okay. So there is an FSCK. It mostly works for almost everything. So there is FSCK. Um, the other thing is that actually most of the time you do not need to use FSCK with ButterFS just because of how it works, right? It has consistent points that it writes. And if you pull the drive, power, anything, it can go back to the last consistent point. So you don't have to go scan your entire file system and find blocks and decide which inodes are free or left over or anything like that. So unless, unless you hit a bug or something bad happened, like your hardware not writing things like it was supposed to, um, which does happen, but you know, in normal cases, you don't actually need to run FSCK. Um, encryption, that is not in a better FS yet. You can do it underneath, and I'll explain that. Um, block deduping is where you have blocks that you wrote independently, and you would put them back together so that you can share that data. Uh, there's experimental uh, code for that, but it's not uh, quite mainline and automatic yet. Uh, the fair amount of companies where I work on ButterFS, uh, you can read the list, I'm not going to read it for you, but it's, you know, it's not just like one or two people are doing this. Who's using it in production? Uh, a little while back I tried to get a list of uh, companies um, who admitted to using ButterFS. <laughs> um, the page may not be up to date, but that gives you an idea of a few companies at least, and there are some big names in there. There's also, you know, companies like Fujitsu that are actually selling products based on ButterFS, so you know, Fujitsu is not exactly a small storage company. But there are people who definitely care and putting effort behind it, uh, which is, you know, always um, a good sign. And um, yeah, you can read the rest of the ButterFS and sorry, the uh, LWN quotes. So um, you're here because I can save you, hopefully save you time on reading all the talks and figuring out what ButterFS can do and how you should use it. Because it definitely doesn't quite work like our file system you're used to uh, like uh, ext4. So you know, we'll look into all those points here, and I'll go through them one by one. So recovery, um, I hate to start with what, when things go wrong, but really as a sysadmin, when I hear uh, about data storage, I want to know what I'm going to do when something happens. And it doesn't matter what you tell me, whether it's stable or not, I expect that things will go wrong. So for the recovery, there's a pretty good wiki. And uh, by the way, BetterFS has man pages, but the BetterFS wiki is definitely a place to go uh, for more cookbooks and details on, uh, on features and what to do when things go wrong. So the first thing, um, and I, by the way, I wrote some pieces of it because I, you know, I thought it might as well be in a place that everyone can read. So um, Scrub, as I mentioned, is something you can run um, maybe every night or once a week. And um, I wrote a little script that lets you uh, run Scrub and find errors and just email them to you. So that way you don't have to uh, find out later that you have data that's not quite the way it's supposed to be. Then you can mount in read-only and recovery mode, which then tells ButterFS to not trust all its data blocks and still let you mount a file system that doesn't look quite right, but good enough for you to get data off it if some, something bad happens. Um, as I mentioned, it's a logging file system, so if somehow it gets wedged between two states where it mounts a new state but it finds stuff that's not quite right, it will not automatically throw away the new state because maybe there is something in there you might want. So a zero log lets you zero the last um, bit that were written and go back to the previous state. Um, and then you get back to the, a good file system uh, before random crap got written. 
And ButterFS Restore is a pretty nice tool that basically lets you mount a ButterFS um, disk image and will scan for files inside. So you don't have to do it yourself with uh, some complicated tools. And it will just, even you know, if all the structures are missing or things went really bad, it will try to find data off it and save it in a different place. And check repair, which is also the better FSCK program, that one is the uh, FSCK that you're used to. Um, it is not nearly as good as the one for ext4, so it will work. But if you have something that you really, really, really care about, you might want to get it through the other means first. And then you can try to fix your FSCK file system. And if you're happy enough with the output of that, then you can continue using the file system. But if it, the repair does a lot of things that look sketchy to you, um, and you haven't gotten all your data yet, you can get your data off it and then just remake the file system. Again, this is not something you do daily, but I'm just telling you what you, know, what you would do if bad things happen. And on, for me, I got a fair amount of experience with that because I had uh, multiple uh, bad SSDs which would not do what they were supposed to. Uh, it's not, I mean, they would also die in corrupt data on top of that, but if you yank power, they would actually not have written all the data that they already had said they wrote, uh, which then made ButterFS unhappy. And those were not better FS bugs, but when you mount next time, it says, oh, my blocks are wrong. So the next thing is um, I always like to plan ahead <laughs> because by the time you are traveling with your laptop and you're giving a better FS talk and you don't have internet because you're on a boat, uh, which has never happened to me, of course, otherwise I would not have written this slide, um, you want to be you know, ready for that beforehand. So... On a laptop, for instance, if you only have one drive and your root file system is on it uh, and then it doesn't mount, well, recovery from there is kind of inconvenient, uh, to say the least. So there's a few things you can do. Of course, you can give the recovery option I just mentioned. That might just be enough to get you out of trouble. Um, the next one is most people use initrd nowadays. Uh, make sure you have the ButterFS tools inside your initrd. That way you can fix the file system from there. Otherwise, you cannot move mount your root file system that your tools are on and then you're in trouble. Um, I'm personally a little bit ex extreme. I actually have two drives in my laptop. I have a one terabyte SSD and one terabyte hard drive and I make sure both are bootable and I copy one to the other. And ButterFS makes that very easy. Uh, I'll give you more details on that later. Um, the little bit I gave at the, at the bottom is to make sure that the ButterFS uh, tools uh, do to get included in your initrd when you build that. So by the time you need it, it will be too late to add it. So Scrub, I did mention Scrub. Um, I mean, if you're interested in that, you can read the slide in more detail in, in the script that I gave at the bottom. But effectively, it will check all the metadata blocks, make sure the checksums are okay so you don't have random corruption. If you're running RAID, it will make sure that both sides of the RAID are, agree on what your data should look like. Um, that's a longish slide to give you an issue with, uh, to fix an issue with Scrub where it would actually tell you it's running when it's not because it got interrupted, maybe a reboot or a crash. It's a simple thing to fix. So if you ever get there, you can just go back to the slide. All right, so I mentioned no encryption. Uh, I personally encrypt everything just because, because I don't want to have to think whether it should be encrypted. They are just encrypted and that way I'm done. Now I mentioned there's no encryption in BRFS. So you would use dmcrypt as one option. Uh, of course, you can also put encryption on top of your file system, but those options are usually not as fast and they're not the ones I prefer. But, so on the dmcrypt side, um, if you have dmcrypt, butterfs, and then you're running RAID on top, uh, maybe a RAID 1 or RAID 5, um, for RAID 5, I would still definitely recommend you use the block level RAID 5 today since the butterfs 1 is not complete. Um, so you have two ways of doing this. You either run dmcrypt on top of your drive and then RAID 5 on top of dmcrypt, or you do it the other way around. And basically what I'm explaining here is that, you're, in my opinion, you're better, better off doing a RAID 5 first and then put dmcrypt on top. And the main reason is if you're doing RAID 5 resyncs, you don't have to be encrypting and recrypting um, on the block layer side. Um, basically, it's, it's copying blocks. They are encrypted, but it doesn't care. It doesn't have to do encryption decryption in that process. And then you put the encrypt on top, which makes it easier because you only have to de-encrypt one block device at boot. Or if, however, you can do it the other way around. And if you want to use uh, ButterFS uh, RAID 5 built-in, then you do have to crypt every single device. Um, there's a script that I gave at the bat uh, bottom of this slide. But effectively, what you do is you decrypt all the drives. They show up in DevMapper. And ButterFS scan will uh, scan all devices available. 
then you tell it to mount one of your X devices, and because VeriFS knows what all the other ones are, it will from one figure out what file system you're mounting, and it will find the other ones for you. So you only have to give the name of one device, and then the rest just works out uh, by itself. You, know, you can also mount by label, of course, like many file systems. So uh, partitions. You don't need to do partitions anymore. Um, the only reason why you would make a partition if you have a single drive is you would have a second root file system on that second partition. So if your first partition with the everything else gets uh, corrupted in a way that it will not mount, then you can have a backup root partition to boot from. Uh, if you have two devices, then you just boot from the second device. So you just create a storage pool, which is basically all your ButterFS blocks, and in that pool, then you create sub-volumes, which are really just fancy directories. And each sub-volume can then be mounted as if it were a mount point. So I'm giving the commands here. You just create them uh, with sub-volume create. And then there's multiple ways of mounting them. The first one, you can uh, give the root, uh, the sub-vol equals root, which is basically the name of the sub-directory. Um, the other option is you would mount, that's the last line on the slide, you would mount the pool of all the sub-volumes, and then you can do a bind mount of that directory to the destination directory where you want to mount um, that file system. And sub-volumes, you can think of them, they're almost different file systems, even though they're contained within the big uh, ButterFS file system. Snapshots. So the reason why, even if you have one partition in, for everything, you still want to create one sub-volume in which uh, you put everything as opposed to just putting it at the root uh, of a ButterFS file system. And once you have sub-volumes, you can snapshot your sub-volumes. And that's how you would do backups, that's how you would replicate to a different place. And that, that command just shows you how it works. Uh, it's very, very simple, right? You just make a, a sub-volume test, um, you create a, f a file in it, then you snapshot to your second file system. You can create a file in a second, delete, the first one, and it's there in the snapshot, but not in the uh, original file system, right? Not a rocket science, but just to show you what the commands look like. The sub-volume snapshots, um, if you look at them with sub-volume show, it will show you that the file system that was snapshot, it keeps track of all the snapshots of itself, so you can actually see that it was snapshotted once. And then, of course, on the snapshot itself, it knows what it points to, which is obvious since it needs to know where it came from. So, um, yeah, backups. <laughs> so I, I tend to make the point that uh, snapshots are super nice, but not, they're not backups. And because I like to make points, I, I'll make my point really uh, well by having two different slides to say the exact same thing. Um, snapshots are really good for, oh, I just overwrote my file, and I really wish I had the copy I had an hour ago. Then you can go back in time, and you can go grab that copy. Great. But it does not help you for... Hardware failure uh, doesn't help you for your file system being scrambled uh, or anything else, right? So it's just one more layer that helps you not have to go fetch your real backup. So if you're on your laptop and you want a file, you don't have to go and find your backup server and retrieve it. You can just go back and copy it from your snapshot. So it's a, it's a time saver, not a backup mechanism, as long as everyone agrees with me on that. <laughs> um, so. The script, which I'm not going to post here because it's a kind of long, but shows you the idea of um, snapshotting the file system. And root is basically a sub-volume I made, which I then mount into slash. Um, daily is showing, and orderlies and weekly show you rotating snapshots. And you can just say how many of each you want. Um, and then that way you can go back in time. Now, um, a time, rel time, and snapshots. So, if you have snapshots and you have, let's say, 16 snaps, snapshots of your file system, every time I touch a file, whether I have a time or real time, um, first time it will, the first one will actually update the access time every time. The other one is, does it once a day? And when you do that, it means that your inode now has to be copied because it's different from all the ones that were snapshotted. And if you have already snapshots, every time you access a file, you're now creating more duplication of your data which means the, the single fact of reading data will actually use up this space, which is not a very uh, intuitive thing. So 
unless you really, really, really need access time, which most people really don't nowadays, just turn it off and then you'll be done. And just to be clear, uh, rel time is usually the default on most distributions. And people think, oh, I'm good, I have rel time, but it actually still updates the A time once a day, which will still cause those problems. Now, um, there are bigger reasons for running out of space. Uh, the biggest one was one I mentioned very early on, which is that um, ButterFS does not always uh, rebalance its data uh, by itself. So you, can, you have the data chunks and metadata chunks, and depending on how they're laid out on disk and whether you create stuff and delete in the wrong order, you can end up with um, basically not having enough place uh, to create a new metadata chunk in the wrong, somehow, uh, without going into very long details. So in that case, you will need to do a rebalance. It's a pretty simple command. Um, it can be done on the running file system. Um, it is IO in intensive, though. And rebalance will go, it will find your data, and it will basically try to free up the partially used blocks and copy data in existing ones, and then it creates, it basically defragments you, your, your space but on the chunk level. Another one is if you have snapshots, let's say I have a 100 gigabyte uh, virtual box image, and then I copy it and delete the original. If in the process of copying, I fill up my disk space, let me, uh, let me go back one step. Let's say I have um, 80 gigs free. My image is 100 gigs. I copy my image into image.2. And after 80 gigs of copying, I fill up my file system. At this point, my file system is actually full. So I say, oh, crap, OK. Um, if I delete the original file, it will not reclaim the space, because it's in all the snapshots that have been saved. So if you needed to reclaim data by deleting your file, and that file has been snapshotted, you actually have to go find all the snapshots that that file is in, and also delete it there. Otherwise, those blocks will not be freed up until the snapshots get rotated off. So that's one thing to know, which is not very obvious when you're not used to that way of working. The next thing is you can just say, oh, you know what? I don't really care about my snapshots. I just want to get back to uh, disk with more space. Let me just delete all my snapshots. So make sure, of course, you delete. Because the snapshots look like sub-volumes. They look all the same. So make sure you don't delete the real one that you care about. But after you delete all the snapshots, um, the disk is not actually reclaimed right away. Uh, ButterFS has a background process that will actually go and reclaim those blocks. And it could take minutes. Um, and sometimes it's taken me like half an hour to get every single lid back. You, you get some of it right away, but you don't get all of it right away. So I tend to run a wild command to just to see, do the FI show uh, that you have at the top. And I can see that number changing over time. So that's just something to know. So the balancing issue we already talked about. Uh, so if you ever get hit by that, or before you get hit by that, you can go read up um, uh, the, the wiki um, where I, I wrote up some details. Also, better if it's actually getting better at doing balancing for you now. So hopefully, in the future, you won't have to do any of this. Compression, uh, pretty simple. You just give it the mount option. Um, the way it works is you can change it every time you mount, and every new file that you create after you change the mount option will be compressed with the new, um, the new scheme. You can also do a rebalance, and rebalancing actually re rewrites all the blocks. And by doing that, you could also recompress to a different compression level. So fragments, um, things get a little bit complicated um, when you have disk images. Because of how copy on write works, if I have a um, 100 gig image and I modify a block in the middle of it, what ButterFS does, by default, they will write a new block at the end of my file, oh well, somewhere else on disk, because you still have the old block being used by snapshots typically. Also. Even if you don't have snapshots, because it's, again, a copy and write file system, it never wants to write in the middle of your file, because if your write is incomplete, now you end up with half written corrupted data. So anything you write will always be at the end. And then maybe the bit in the middle of your file will get invalidated and freed up. What this means, however, on, on a big file system image, you will end up with a very fragmented file. So in most cases, it doesn't matter. But in a disk image, like a virtual box image, um, it will get fragmented badly. Turns out on, on an SSD, I had like many, many fragments I did not even know I did. But on a hard drive, uh, you would pay that 
uh, for that DLA. So there's a ch attribute command to actually tell butterfs please do not use copy and write for that file or that entire directory to avoid the problem that I'm, uh, I just mentioned. There's also a defragment command, but I, I found that it doesn't um, defragment. It doesn't work with a very big file. It's just uh, too too slow. So you're better off copying the file um, into new blocks and then deleting the old blocks. That's something that will need to be improved because well, it should just do that better. Um, blocked data duplication. I did mention that. So. There's um, a couple of commands that, to, that uh, can do it. One is offline. There's someone trying to work, put it into the kernel, so it would actually look and find uh, blocks and you know dedupe, dedupe them for you. It's not quite there yet. Um, but what you can do when you're copying data is you can use the, the reflink uh, command to CP, which basically means when you're copying, only copy the inodes and then point the inodes to the same data blocks. And that is, again, as I mentioned earlier, much better than having just hard links. ButterFS send receive. So that actually was the killer app for me on ButterFS outside of snapshots, which, um, who does backups with rsync here? Okay, fair amount of people. Um, you probably know that if you have 100,000 files or a million files that rsync spends a day and a half um, scanning all those inodes and then doing the same on the other side and then saying, oh, okay, now I know what to do. And sometimes it could take five minutes to copy data and an hour to actually scan inodes on each side. So with ButterFS, you don't need to do that, right? It knows exactly what changed between a previous snapshot and a new snapshot. So there's no scanning required. And then it doesn't need to say, oh, which part of that file changed or what do I need to send? It knows, oh, only those blocks changed because it has been keeping track of that. So it will send just those changed blocks to the other side and it reconstruct the new file system on the other side uh, with very little data copied. So that's what ButterFS and Receive do. Um, they're a little bit... Um, it takes a bit of work to use from the command line, so there's scripts that uh, do that for you. I wrote one, there's a link there, there's other ones you can choose from. Now, so part of my title was um, doing server image replication. Um, so I don't know if any of you were at my talk last year. Uh, part of my talk was, you know, one way to replicate servers as opposed to doing, sorry, one, one way to keep servers up to date is don't run apt or yum from cron because you always end up in a state where it half ran, machine got rebooted, has someone modified files, and then the server is in some inconsistent state. Um, and at that point, the only thing you can really do is just delete the image and start over, which you can do in automate, that's perfectly fine. Um, but one thing uh, we do at Google, and we've been doing, because that was from a long time ago, is we just copy an image on top on a file level. Now, if you know, again, rsync, which I just mentioned, with rsync, that would be expensive and slow just because scanning all the inodes is, is expensive. But if you can use ButterFS uh, send receive, you can actually create a new snapshot uh, on a server, which is with very minimal uh, data copy, which is what the new image should look like. And then you can point, just uh, move your mount point to the new server image. And then very quickly, you now make that new image to your new live uh, image on that machine. The other great thing is if someone's been modifying the live server in ways they were not supposed to, but that's okay because you just wipe it all out, having the new image be the new uh, one that you're pointing to. So it's one way to do uh, image replication, which in my opinion is much faster and more reliable than uh, using other means. So yeah, for, for your personal use, um, I did mention I have two drives on my, uh, on my laptop. Again, I used to use rsync. So I had my SSD and then my early cron shop that would be and try to copy to the hard drive during which my mouse pointer was not moving nearly as fast, <laughs> which is kind of sad, but it's still true. So again, with ButterFS send um, and receive, I have my early snapshots. It knows exactly what changed and just copies those blocks on the hard drive on the other side and it does that in like a minute or sometimes even less. And that is just uh, very fast. Then I just need to move a symlink on the other side saying, hey, this is my now, my user file system is pointing to this snapshot and if I ever boot that hard drive, it would actually follow the symlink and mount the correct uh, copy of the last snapshot that's up to date. And that is just so much faster. Again, I have a script that can do that for you, so you don't have to write it yourself. So, I, yeah, I did mention doing that. Uh, why? 
SSDs, I did mention how they die. They're a li little bit better nowadays, but um, if you think you can use smart for SSDs, don't. Uh, smart and many SSDs are, it's just utterly worthless. Um, my drives worked perfectly fine until, bam, they didn't. And of course, I wasn't home half the time. So yeah, just make sure you have copies um, and BetterFS is a good way of doing that. The other thing too, yes, uh, the last the last bit I forgot is um, just because one backup is not enough for me, then I back up that to my home server. And I used to do that with our sync, which again never worked. If I'm in a hotel wireless, but the, because, especially because of latency, going back and forth saying, do you have this? I know, yes, I do. Do you have this? I know, yes, I do. Multiply by a million. Uh, it would finish uh, <laughs> by the time I got home. Um, now with BetterFS, it knows exactly what to push. And I'm actually able to push images from my backup uh, actually overnight on a wireless uh, across the world. And that's actually kind of nice. That's in case my, I lose my laptop or something. So that was kind of the, uh, the point here. So if you ever have to do backups, uh, backups of backups, it gets a bit complicated. Uh, I'm not going to read the slide. You can basically look at the different ways of doing it. Um, but you can do it with snapshots or sync. You can do uh, the CP uh, link, which will do um, hard links first. And then you can do R sync on top. And the last one is you can do, use a breath link, um, which makes use of better FS. So for RAID, um, there's a web page you can read in details. But the thing that's interesting about BetterFS is that you can give multiple different RAID levels for metadata, which is you know all your inodes and so forth, uh, versus data. So you can make your metadata uh, more uh, redundant than uh, the data itself, which is like, well, why would you do that? Well, I could actually make my metadata RAID 1 and then my data blocks RAID 0, which means if I lose a drive, Sure, I'm going to lose the data blocks that are on that drive that's gone, but at least my file system structure is still there. I can still run fine and see what files were there, uh, which is better than having a scrambled file system where you can't even find out uh, what you had and what you lost. Um, the interesting thing is when you do um, RAID and on BetterFS is you can change the RAID level, and all you have to do is a, a balance command. And balancing will actually take all your blocks and relay, relay lay them out again using the new scheme. So by default, when I add a drive, let's say I have a RAID 1 and I add a third drive, I can make it RAID 5. All I do is just say, hey, here's a third drive and now you're RAID 5. What happens is that every new file is now laid out in RAID 5 fashion, while the old ones are laid out in RAID 1. So you actually have a mix until all your files get rewritten. And by doing a balance, you can just say, OK, just take all the data you have and rewrite it. That way, it's now laid out in RAID 5 fashion. And that's the same thing that happens um, if you just add a drive. Let's say I have three drives, and I add a fourth drive. I just add it. Nothing really happens. Just new files will be laid out in four. If I want to have everything laid out again properly, I can tell better effort to do that. And that's kind of nice, because it means you can decide when you're going to take the impact of rewriting everything. Or if you don't care about your old data, you can just leave it on three drives. You know it's going to get deleted, and all the new data is on four drives. So it gives you flexibility on how you're going to do this. Uh, shrinking is about the same thing. It basically rebalances everything to not use the uh, extra drive you're about to remove, and then you're done. Or if you have um, parity, then it can do it from parity. So. Um, now, if, you haven't, if I haven't convinced you yet, uh, now is time for you to have a look if you have uh, interest in any of those features. Uh, it's not something that you have to keep waiting for, for that, uh, you know, that label of, uh, um, on the, in a kernel saying it's not quite production ready yet. It is really usable uh, for many, many cases. Uh, you just have to evaluate it before you put you know, all your servers on it to make sure your workload and um, use case is fine with it. But it's definitely used in production for many uh, workloads already. Uh, and there's things, again, like Docker or SUSE that actually effect, specifically make use of those features. RAID 5 uh, and 6, as I mentioned, um, you can play with them. I would not use production with them yet. Just put the MDADM RAID 5 underneath if you need that. Uh, block dedupe needs a bit more work, so if you care about that, uh, feel free to contribute. And uh, 2015 is the year for you to evaluate. So there we go. 
I try to speak a bit quickly to give uh, time for answers. So, I have questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll give answers. So, what questions do you have? Yes. We're um, looking at using Postgres um, as a relational database. Um, mm -hmm. We've heard rumours that performance of databases on better FS file systems is quite poor. Uh, is there any independent testing or um, do you have any benchmarks that are available? So the big thing is whether you have snapshots. And the whole uh, copy and write issue with uh, file, um, uh, file system images that I just mentioned, um, Many databases kind of uh, will try to lay out data blocks on top of one another, which with BetterFS means you can have new blocks written and then you have fragmented uh, fragmentation. So if you, uh, I'm not a Postgres expert, uh, but depending on how it lays out the data, it may not work very well with snapshots. It will work, but your performance will suffer a little bit. But if you configure um, that directory, it doesn't have to be the whole file system. You can just configure the directory to be not copy on write. In that case, you'll have performance that should be similar to what you would have with AXT4. But I don't have benchmarks. I, I do use you know, databases, but not in a way that's uh, performance critical. Also, the, sorry, and the other thing I forgot to mention is a lot of them just, they don't even want a file system. They just want to write to the block device themselves. So if you really care about performance, the, issue is, the answer is don't put any of that. Just give them direct block I.O. access. Correct. So he's, yeah, he's mentioning that if you turn off copy and write, it turns off by checksumming of your blocks, which then puts you back to where you were with the XT4. Next question. The steps on your recovery slide, are they in general order of preference, like smallest stick to biggest stick? Uh, yes, I believe that I did put them in order of things to try. Correct. The last one being the FSCK one, because that one is destructive. Like the other ones are re like uh, read-only recovery doesn't modify, right? The, uh, the restore one, they will try to gra grab data out and copy it somewhere else. So again, you know, whatever you get is free and it doesn't modify your file system. The last one will modify it. I've got a couple other quick ones. Sure. You talked about removal of a volume and in order to shrink. Yes. Can you also do shrinking of individual volumes, like reduce the size of, of them? So within a ButterFS pool, I call it a pool myself, I just think of it as a pool of blocks. Subvolumes are just directories. So unless you're using um, uh, the quota uh, subsystem, there's no limit. Any of those directories being, you know, subvolumes can grow to any size up to the full size of the pool. So there's no resizing going on really. Was that yeah, your question? No. Can, can you resize the underlying block device to make you to move from a 100 gig file system to an 80 gig, let's say? Oh, right, right, right. Um, you know what? I don't remember if you can. That's you basically saying modifying the size of your block device underneath. Every time I've done this, I've just added a new block device and I added it to the same pool, so I didn't have to resize. I just gave it new blocks to write to. And the only way, the only time you would really Modify a block device size itself as if you had partitions, which, as I said, you know, don't bother anymore. Or if you had LVM underneath, which, no, please, I mean, you can, but don't run LVM and ButterFS on top. There's no reason to do that. So the answer is, I'm not sure, but there would be no reason to do so anyway. Okay. And one last one. Does RAID 1 equal RAID 10 in, in ButterFS if you have two replicas but more than two devices? Okay, say so that one again. Yeah. So if you have a RAID in the, um, the standard RAID subsystem, you can actually have a RAID 10 device with three devices in it, for example. Right. And it will stripe those blocks across all of the different um, devices appropriately and still give you two copies of every block. Correct. Does, um, does ButterFS RAID 1 do that? Yes, my understanding is that ButterFS RAID 1 will basically ensure that you have two copies on two drives. You just don't have control of what those two drives are. And with MDDM RAID 1, you can actually give it three drives and have your data written three times. If you give three drives to RAID 1 on a better FS, it will use three drives but copy everything twice. That's my current understanding. And there are people asking on, saying, hey, I want RAID 1, but I want three copies. But I don't think that has been added yet.
or if it did, it just got added. Next question. Um, you said that there was a uh, scrubbing tool. Yes. Do you have to take the drive offline to use that scrubbing tool? No, no, no not at all. I mentioned it was online at the beginning, so it's something you run nightly. Uh, there's no, the only thing is performance because it will obviously keep your drive busy doing that, but it happens in the background. Okay, thank you. And then it will syslog errors. Uh, so you can, my script basically runs it and then it finds the errors and syslogs and emails them to you. Other questions? Over there? Hey, um, I was wondering, is there a way to determine what files are in a snapshot? You said before that you may have to delete all snapshots to gain that space again for deleting a file. Is there a way to determine using ButterFS tools that um, only those snapshots contain that particular file? So um, the snapshots are sub-volumes. If you go back to the root ButterFS pool, you can go in each of those sub-volumes and see if the file is present. So that would be the easiest way of doing that. Um, but the, the thing about the whole game about how much do I gain if I delete a file when it's in multiple snapshots which may have different views and blocks for, for that specific file, that's kind of, kind of hard math because you know, it, it's not the same file with not the same size in each snapshot. It's kind of hard to compute what you're getting back. But if you just want to delete the file and all the snapshots it's present in, you can do that. You can also do that ls command with, you know, you put a star for the uh, subvolume name, then you give the whole path, and it will show you how many copies of that file and how big that file is in each of those snapshots. So it gives you an idea uh, how much data could be used. If they all look the same, you know it's one copy, for instance. Other time. I think we're good. So enjoy lunch. Thank you for coming.